Welcome back to the show. We're about to learn the secret sauce. Perfect. I'm done. Thanks for making the drive over. Of course. My pleasure. Always yeah. good to see you. Yeah. And so I guess I'm going to ask the question, who are you? What do you do? Yeah. My name is uh, Amjad Massad. I am. Uh, was born and raised in Jordan. I came to the U.S. Uh, 10 years ago to work in technology. I've been always interested in learning and how to make things easier to use. Um, and like my sort of current obsession and passion started um, maybe when I was uh, in, in, when I was in college, I was like 20, 21 years old, and I was so frustrated about with how hard it is to get started with programming. Yeah. I didn't have a laptop, and every time I'd go to a, a computer science uh, class, um, you'd sort of, like, let's say, object-oriented programming in Java or a C or a Python course, You'd have to set up the environment over and over again. Sharing programs between yeah. students was so you actually hard. go in the class without a laptop, so you're using like desktop machine. Yeah, I'm using the the computer lab. Okay, the got it. Yeah. So you'd have to like sit down and have to like download like you know gigabytes worth of software. <laughs> um, I don't know. There was an open source Java ID. We used NetBeans at the time. It was like yes. two gigabytes or something like that, and um, and it was just like it was like a huge headache, and you would spend a lot of time on it, and then. You know, you share a program, and you know your friend is missing a DLL or something, and <laughs> yeah, um, and it just like you know nothing worked, uh, and we would like the best thing we had was like Google Docs for sharing uh, yeah programs, and so that's how I kind of started thinking about the idea of like how do you make it easy for people to get started with programming? Um, it seems just like very artificially hard, and. The reason probably there isn't a lot of software engineers and programmers of the world, the reason people think it's such a hard skill to acquire is because uh, is because like there's this barrier to entry. And also like I started thinking the, through the implications of what does it mean to have more people interested in programming? What does it mean when um, when sort of uh, the 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 skill of computing becomes something that's more decentralized. And so not necessarily everyone has to become a software developer, but what does it mean for people to really understand how computers work? I started reading Alan Kay, you know, he had the famous line, the computer revolution hasn't started yet. The real computer re revolution hasn't started yet. Um, and so the idea was that <clears throat> we're heading into this really suboptimal place in, in computing where you have the consumers and you have the producers and you know there's like a few number of people that can make and manipulate software and the vast majority of people are just like sort of mere consumers of that software and i wasn't you know the only one obviously thinking about this there's so many people thinking about this that led to innovations and no code tools and yeah databases and all of that but we're taking a more kind of democratizing code approach yeah yeah and i don't even think if we mention Co-founder of Repolit, oh, so yeah. that's the product you're actually working on today. Yes. Uh, and we'll get to like talking about the product and what you like, what the product looks like today, because I think it's such an interesting story of where you started and what you have now. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll get there. But um, you said you're from Jordan, yes. uh, grew up, born, raised, yeah. and uh, so did. How did you get involved in computers in Jordan? Yeah. So my, um, I was uh, although you know we didn't have a lot of money growing up, but. My father is an engineer. He's actually a Palestinian refugee. And generally, Palestinians have felt that uh, for them to get ahead in the world and you know, be able to, um, to change their circumstances, they focus a lot on education. And so my, all my father's family was highly educated. He, he, was, in, uh, he was educated in Turkey, doing uh, engineering. And he was always interested in technology. And so he really extended himself to be able to buy a computer early on. So in 1993, I got our first computer, which I believe was an IBM computer, IBM PC. It had MS-DOS on it. And um, it just one of my earliest memories was standing behind my dad's back while he's kind of typing DOS commands. Yeah. 
and I was immediately fascinated. Like this thing, like you can actually tell it to do something and it just does it. And, uh, and like after he's done, I would like, you know, sneak into the back into the room and like play with the computer. Um, I, I couldn't get access to programming environments. I like would mess around with dot bat files, if you remember those, but it took a while for me to go from just like messing around with the computer to actually find a programming environment. Uh, and the first one was actually a visual programming environment that I also can't remember its name, but I remember going to a computer store, finding the CD ROM for it and, and kind of taking it home and installing it. And I started building games for my brother. Uh, it had some scripting language. A lot of it was visual too. I built math learning games from my younger brother who who works at Replit today. So oh, nice. <laughs> so my initial investment has not gone to waste, <laughs> um, and so I, I taught him math uh, using like you know interactive uh, programs I built, um, and then my first real software that I made was in around. Uh, 98, 99, I got obsessed with Counter-Strike. And so I would go to these internet cafes um, and uh, I, we would play Counter-Strike with, with other people, you know, like a LAN cafe. And um, what I noticed was that everyone there, um, like th there was computers everywhere, but they didn't use computers to manage the store. So everything was manual. Yeah. And so I wrote software to manage the, the entire store and I started... I started selling that software and that was, uh, I think I started writing it when I was like uh, 12 or 13, I got it to market when I was 15 and I was able to kind of build a small company around that. That's amazing. And is that what, um, well, once I want to really quickly mention the, uh, there's a meme that Dan Abramoff started on Twitter about his CS background being mm. Counter-Strike. No, oh, yeah. Because <laughs> he doesn't have a That's CS true. degree. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I have a CS degree. <laughs> amazing. But yeah, so you built a company to mm. manage I guess, operating stores. Mm -hmm. And uh, so is that what got you eventually to the States to like, what's the, what's the step over to get to the States and go to school here? So back to the story where I was, uh, you know, frustrated with setting up the development environment, I started thinking like, there must be a way to like go to the browser and start coding. At the time, if you remember, let's say, I think it, this time it was 2007, eight, um, uh, Google Docs was like a huge yeah. thing, right? And it was like amazing that you can like, you don't have to install Word, you can like share it with people. I was like, okay, what is the Google Docs for code? That's literally the idea that I had. And like I would search for it and I couldn't find anything. Mozilla had actually uh, an experiment going on. Um, it, it was called Bespin at the time. So okay. Bespin became Ace and Ace became Cloud9. Oh, okay, right? yes. So there, there's like a lineage there. <laughs> Uh, but before even Cloud9 happened, there wasn't really anything anywhere that was like really useful. Um, and so I, I wrote a small REPL, literally a text area, a button, and you would type some JavaScript and you would hit that button. It will eval it and will like put it in an alert. And I wrote it like in like 30 minutes, like it yeah. doesn't take anything. And I started using it and I shared it with my friends. We we're all kind of learning JavaScript. And... And I was surprised that they were so excited by it. Like just the fact that you can go to browser window, type some code and eval it, it was like a profound thing. And I was like, okay, there's something there. Let me go build it further. And so um, I was getting into compilers and interpreters at the time. So I wrote a toy Lisp interpreter. So I, I had a drop down where it could change languages and now we had Lisp. Um, and so people started using that. Um, and it was like this very iterative process. Um, so that was uh, 2008, maybe going into 2009. The wall I hit was like, I couldn't get any like actually um, useful language in there other than JavaScript. So like I wanted Python or Java, something we were learning at school. And, um, and so I started writing a Python interpreter just naively. And I, 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 I think I got it to just print hello world at some point, but I just thought I was like, okay, if this is going to be a company or something that people use, uh, you know, I'm basically maintaining all these interpreters, uh, and I have to, you know, just, uh, backport anything that happens on the main branch and see Python. This just doesn't seem like it's going to work. And so I kind of put the project down. I was kind of bummed out about it. I guess like I can't build it. Um, 
and uh, at the time, it, was, it didn't cross my mind that I could run it on the server. It just yeah. seemed like a very expensive thing to do, and it was. So I think uh, maybe 2010, uh, Mscripton um, from Mozilla had just, uh, had just come out as a research project. So Mozilla had this research team, and um, someone there um, uh, who, who's still active in WASM and, and all of that, I think his name is Alan... Um, and he, he built Mscripten. Basically, Mscripten was the fundamental insight that the uh, LLVM IR, so the LLVM is the compiler tool chain, IR is intermediate representation. Basically, you can um, compile um, any like native language like C to a uh, cross-platform representation, and then you can cross-compile it to different architectures. Yeah. And so the LVM IR kind of looks like JavaScript. It just have F statements and for loops and whatever. And so they basically are like, oh, let's translate it to JavaScript. Um, and and Mscripten was like really early on, but I saw the promise in it. So we started using it. We started actually contributing to it, uh, me and my friends in college. And we had this big b- breakthrough where we compiled Python, Lua, Ruby, a bunch of languages to yeah. JavaScript. And we built this project called JS REPL. We put it up in <laughs> GitHub. Yeah. And uh, we started building a lot of the tools around what, what would make up Replit. Um, and we open source everything. And um, actually, a uh, company in the US, uh, I think we're around 2011 now. I had just graduated. I was working at Yahoo in Jordan. Yahoo had acquired a company in Jordan. Uh, but I was still doing the, all this open source stuff at night. And um, Code Academy had just went through YC, and their idea is like, we want to make interactive programming courses. And they had like a really breakthrough idea at the time. And they use all the open source stuff, which I felt like it was still a draft. They, they use all your open source yeah, stuff. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so that's like the power of GitHub and open source is that, like, you know, a kid from Jordan can like build something that two other kids from the US can like yeah. build a startup on. So I saw it on Hacker News, and I was like, wow, this is like using my thing. I think you could probably go find my comment <laughs> uh, somewhere there. And so they reached out, and they're like, we want to we want to work together. I'm like, actually, I want to start my own startup. I have this idea for a company called Replit. And, you know, I, we, we want to make it yeah. we want to make it a thing. Did you have the URL Replit back, yeah. back then? Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and, and, but, you know, it, it was hard to get funding in Jordan. Um, it, it you know it, it just it just needed a lot of work before it could generate any revenue, um, and so eventually it just made sense for me to to join them. And they they were they were doing and they still are doing a lot of good in the world where a lot of people who wouldn't otherwise be coding and kind of solving the problem I really set out to solve. So it just made sense to join them. So they got me an O one visa, nice. Um, and I came to New York and joined Code Academy as the first. Uh, employee there yeah that's a that's amazing story and like i i'm just thinking of myself and that story and where i was at at that time because mm-hmm. code academy is like the first time i actually did any ruby um i was like pushed through tutorials or youtube videos or something like that use code academy learn the basics and i learned the basics of javascript after being a perfectionist in copy and pasting <laughs> uh, i could find answers and run quit scripts or do mods on games and stuff like that but i didn't know what i was doing right so it was my opportunity to finally learn what I was doing. So I don't have a CS degree. I do. Yeah. I did play Counter Strike in, in <laughs> high school and college as well. And uh, but I, I just think that's so fascinating that you just had an itch that you scratched. You shared it with the world. Somebody started a company around it. But then that same company found you and was like, "We have a job for you." Yes. And I it's think amazing. Yeah. And I think yeah. recruiting and staffing or whatever through open source, like there's such an opportunity there. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of folks who might not go to the Stanfords or go to the Columbia's or wherever to learn computer science, but they know what they're doing and they just need yeah. like, they need a little bit of support or maybe financial support to work on this full time. Yeah. Actually I wrote an article about it's, it's on my blog. I think uh, something about GitHub and, and sort of just people who are underprivileged. Um, th- there was a lot of talk in the tech community about, Hey, actually, using GitHub as a resume is like a bad thing because 
it's like I don't know they made up reasons about like it being like discriminatory or something like that. I was like, actually no, it's actually the opposite, right? Like we, you can discover people who wouldn't otherwise be discovered because resumes are basically like you know people who are already uh, are already well off and kind of like like to get into Stanford and all of that. It's not totally meritocratic. They're trying to make it, but for most of most people, it's sort of you already have to have that sort of lineage. You already have to yeah. have uh, a certain background in order to get into these Ivy League universities, to get to internships. It's about connections. Yeah. And so these padded resumes tend to be like privilege, right? And well, not to mention that a lot of like the preparatory schools, um, like how middle school, even middle school and high school students are preparing to make that college yes. resume. Yeah. For like eight years, from sixth grade and on, they're like they're already prepared. So like. Me being born in the States, right. I didn't have that sort of support to be able to say, okay, I've been working on this resume. Let me go get it in the college. Like, I didn't have that network. Right. So I ended up just going to the school closest to me. Uh, but going back to this GitHub thing and like GitHub as a resume, it you get exposure in a different way. Mm-hmm. And it's not the only way to get a job. And I think we should definitely, not the only way to get a job, definitely mm-hmm. still do a resume and apply to a bazillion applications and good luck. But also build something that you think would be cool to have in the world. You don't have to spend nights and weekends, so it does help. But also, like, you know, just steal some time at lunch. Steal some time in the morning to, to work on things that you really care about. And then eventually, hopefully, somebody will reach out to you or you move on to something else. And it is, it's as close as we can get to an honest labor market, in my opinion, because what, what the, the function that the resume plays is that – I can do the job, right? Yeah. Like, what? what's better than I can do the job <laughs> yeah. than, like, running code? <laughs> yeah, or having a merged PR and saying, right. look, it, it got merged in. I figured it out. Yeah. Like, I actually, I coach so many people and mentor people randomly on Twitter as they look to, as when I worked at GitHub, a lot of people reach out to me, like, hey, how do I get a job? How do I get involved in open source? Like, talk about it. Mm. So if you get a PR merge, write a blog post. Yep. Best thing you can do is write a blog post about act exactly that PR and how you got through the hurdles, how you collaborated with people across the world. Because one, you're going to show you can work with a team. Two, you can show you can get production-ready code, like, in production. Yeah, that's uh, huge. Yeah, it, like, it's amazing. Yeah. And there's so many open source projects that depend. So, like, the JS REPL. Mm-hmm. Code Academy depended on that to right. get through YC or at least have a something at Demo Day. Right. Or pretty close to something ready at Demo Day. That is paramount to now you now you can because you know that it works out that you worked at Code Academy, but like you could also take that story and be like, hey, other companies or Facebook, which you eventually made it over to, and Google, I can do code. Let's let's well, do so, this. So there's another piece of the backstory there is that I actually had applied to Google like maybe five times and got rejected okay. all times because Google was starting to recruit in the in the Middle East, and a couple of people from my university actually got offers from Google. I couldn't, and part of the reason, like, I'm not your traditional sort of, you know, book nerd. Like, I'm actually, I don't, like, I'm, I'm always, like, I always have passing grades in university because yeah. I don't really worry too much about it. I just want to hack things, right? And um, and so I, like, I was not actually getting interviews. But when I had this out and then when I had the job at Code Academy and then I had a bit of a reputation, it opened so many doors for me. Like, yeah. the Google offers started coming in, the Facebook, the, all of those things. Yeah, so at Code Academy, you worked on their compiler to mm-hmm. so you can code multiple different languages and frameworks in the browser. Yes, um, but you eventually left. So what what caused you to leave Code Academy? Um, I, I mean, as you know, you're you're uh, you're, you're an early stage uh, um, startup employee. It's it's uh, it's not easy, right? It's yeah. a sort of. Uh, uh, it's a, it's a lot of work, so a lot of stress, especially if if you don't feel like you're close to the decision making or you don't have a lot of autonomy. Um, it, it it was a great company, it's still a great company, but at the time, I just felt like I, you know, wasn't um, contributing something uh, so like I, I wasn't giving my best to the world, right? I, I wanted to really have a big impact, um, and. And I thought Code Academy is in good shape, and the founders are very talented. We built the initial platform. We got tens of millions of users, and they're off to the races. And I thought, okay, maybe there's something else I could do. Um, now, of course, you know, starting another startup was an option. Uh, but um, 
at the time, I was actually really into this idea of like, how do we bring computing to more people in the world? And so uh, Mark Zuckerberg was starting to talk about internet.org. And I remember looking at the growth of Android as a, like a computing device. And I was like, oh, Android is going to be the main computing device for most of the people in the world, which is the case right now. Yeah. Right? Like, what is it? Like two, three billion people are just on Android tablets yeah. and, and phones. Uh, I was like, okay, um, you know, how can we give these people like tools, tools for learning, tools for knowledge, eventually coding. Um, and, uh, and I was really interested in that. So I joined uh, Facebook to do that. But the way the process at Facebook works is that you get an interview, you do the interview and everything, and then you have to go inside, you do the boot camp, and then you have to interview again at the time at least with the team you want to join. So I should yeah. try to join internet.org, but they didn't want, they didn't want me. <laughs> I didn't have like necessary skills or, or whatever. I did a brief stint on on photos, I uh, and then I started contributing to React uh, internally at uh, Facebook. And the React uh, project was run by a really sort of old school team at Facebook, kind of really tenured people. This was pre-Tom? That, Tom, Tom was on the team. He was on the team, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, Lee Byron, yeah. um, uh, Jordan, you know, all these people. And they were like kind of these like, you know, off, on the corner kind of inventing the future of, of, yeah. of the web. Uh, and I really wanted to work there. And Tomo kept telling me, Tomo Kino kept telling me, like, you have to do at least one year on product engineering before you can join product infrastructure. Yeah. And I just didn't take no for an answer. And I just, like, kept contributing internally and writing things externally as well. And eventually they're like, ah, okay, I guess, you know, I guess we'll hire you. And so um, I was still in New York. And so I was tasked with, at the time, so React Native was still in its infancy. It was called Catalyst, actually, internally. And I, I, I remember gone, getting on a, on a Zoom call with, or whatever we used at the time, with uh, Jordan Walk, the inventor of JavaScript, uh, inventor of <laughs> React. React. Yeah. <laughs> and he was, who was starting React Native, and he told me, we need a packager for React Native, and it needs to be, Webpack was the, the thing at the time, it needs to be a lot faster than Webpack. It needs to, be, it needs to recompile in like 100 milliseconds. So every recompile needs to be 100 milliseconds. So that's like a really tall order. But I took it as a challenge and I started building the React Native uh, packager. And that was my entry to the product infrastructure team and eventually moved to California to be closer to them. Okay. Excellent. That's amazing. Uh, amazing story. I didn't know about the, the name, the internal name in Catalyst. Maybe it was a previous conference talk. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you're working on the, the compiler for React Native, which I also, also injecting myself into your story. Mm -hmm. I learned mobile development on React Native. That's like awesome. I did Objective C first, and I did Swift, and then that same year I learned both those things. Mm -hmm. uh, and the year Swift came out, React Native came out, and uh, or came out publicly. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I built a couple apps, and like it was like a lot of fun. And I got really excited about doing mobile development. Actually, I built at Netlify uh, as an early employee at Netlify. Mm -hmm. uh, I built a, a dashboard to see like your deploys for your mm -hmm. sites. Mm -hmm. uh, and I did that because I was like, oh, React Native is like the best thing. And uh, I never shipped it. And I, ended up, I eventually left mm. uh, without ever shipping that publicly. But but I mean, that's a good point. Like the, the reason I got excited about React Native is that like going back to this idea of a REPL, interactive yeah. programming, making things more accessible, React Native felt, okay, I couldn't do internet.org, but actually what I can do is I can make mobile more accessible. Yeah. And so I got really excited about this vision, and React Native did, it, you know, make mobile way more accessible, probably a hundred times more accessible. One thing, one focus we had before before launching in 2015 was um, we, we had this internal metric time to the hello world. So with, you know, with Objective C or Swift or whatever, you have to download. Uh, you know, Xcode, and you have to do all these configuration. You have to spend a lot of time before you just see anything on the screen. And we really wanted to beat that in a cross-platform fashion. And so the React Native Packager actually it was like a sort of a guided wizard. And from that came the idea of um, of Create React App. Right? Yeah. So Create React App was actually sort of what we built for the React Native yeah. uh, 
their Act Native project, and you could in five minutes to get a mobile app, and so yeah, yeah, I loved it. Yeah, because you ended up getting the uh, the React Native screen, and uh, then you start manipulating it to what you want it exactly, uh, and then throw in some data somewhere, and the fast reload that was like that yeah. was the thing that uh, yeah, and I think like, other company like companies like Expo and other. Uh, I know Flutterflow is Flutter based, but there's like other companies that, that take that model and have gone even further yes. past that. But I think what's been really fascinating is like your initial pitch in, in school of where you just want to get ready to write code and not have mm-hmm. to install a bunch of stuff. Uh, like you had that true to form with Code Academy and with React Native and building mobile apps. Uh, and then now you have Repl.it. So yeah. I basically yeah. had one idea in life. <laughs> yeah. Right. I'm just pursuing it. Yeah. Yeah. You just conti- yeah. continue to perfect that. And it's honestly, it's not too like you have success in Repl. Mm-hmm. Y'all, congratulations on recent funding and like mm-hmm. growing community and adoption, new features, which we'll talk about in a sec. Mm-hmm. But the fact that like most founders will probably go back to the same thing over and over again. Mm-hmm. And, but you always had Repl like in your back pocket. Right. So, like at Code Academy, at Facebook, did you have the URL? Were you working on it? Yes, I was. Um, I wasn't actively working on it um, at Code Academy. You know, they didn't like me working on it at Facebook. It was like a little. I was like worried about like the you know IP, like the IP and all, thing, yeah. all of that. So um, I responded to bugs. I like maintained the open source project here and there, um, and uh, in like 2015 when. Uh, you know, we released React Native. I um, t- towards the end of uh, 2015, my role at Facebook, kind of like at Code Academy, was sort of like coming to a conclusion. It was like, all right, it's like okay, React is you know is growing, React Native is growing. Like, what am I gonna do here? And so I started toying around with a lot of things. We were working at Babel on Babel and Jest and all these things as well. But I I felt like that it was time to start something new. And my wife, uh, Haya, she's uh, she's a designer, and she helped us uh, really early on with the with the JS Rappel open source project. And she was like, actually, always designing like logos for my open source projects <laughs> and and landing pages and whatnot. And and she, um, and that's like that's that part is sort of her story, but. Um, she struggled to find a job in the U.S. So she's a designer, and she had been interviewing for a year or two, and she would, like, go all the way in interviews and uh, get to the last stage and get rejected. Um, she went and did a boot camp. She did General Assembly. She did UI, UX, and she, you know, she, she built a lot of um, know-how and a lot of uh, a big portfolio, but she still couldn't land a job. And, you know, I suggested to her is like, why don't you just take some time off, like build a side project and maybe like have really a flagship thing on your portfolio that you can show. And um, and she she asked me, okay, whatever happened to like that Replit project? Are you, are you still working on it? I was like, you know, it has a few users and uh, and like maybe we can develop it more. And so she, she took it on. And so credit goes to her to kind of reviving the project. So she... Uh, she designed, it didn't have any user accounts. It was just like the static page that yeah. was like running JS Rebel basically. And she designed user accounts. She designed like a new user flows. She did user interviews. She does just like, did like she applied her knowledge fully into it. Um, and then um, my brother Faris, who's, who's now one of our early engineers, still at the company, um, started working with her to kind of, develop more features for Replit. I started doing weekends and nights at the time. And, you know, pretty quickly, it started exploding in usage. Like, it really didn't take a lot. We just, like, fixed a few things. I actually, what I did is I moved the evaluation from the client side to the server side. Yeah. There are a few reasons why I did that. Maybe we can get into it. But kind of the primary reason was feature completeness. I want people to not worry that this environment is emulated somehow. I wanted to kind of feel it's the real thing. Um, and and by virtue of doing that, we added a bunch of languages. And so the users started exploding. In t- April 2016, when I quit, it was really obvious that that this thing is, is going to work to some capacity yeah. of work, right? We, we had started making some money as well. Um, and um, and I was like, okay, it was it was really easy. It wasn't too easy because, you know, still like for the first time in my life, I'm making actual money at Facebook. And so, and my 
parents are proud of me. Everyone back in Jordan was like, you know, was like, <laughs> yeah. oh, you know, we have a Jordanian in Facebook. I was like the the, the only guy there, and um, and it, it, there was still some feeling of like, oh, I'm like letting go of something really valuable. But I always come back to this idea of like, what am I doing in the world that is unique, that is like bringing value to the world? And anytime you feel like you're a cog in a machine, yeah. I just always feel like, okay, I need to go do something else. So that ultimately that was the kind of deciding factor. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've had a very recent experience of that when I left GitHub as well. Like uh, I did a lot of good work and I got to do a lot of community stuff as well, just sort of bringing more people into fold and like growing up more engineers to be educated through GitHub. Um, but also felt very similar where I had an itch to do something else mm -hmm. um, that would have been bigger. And that's what I'm working on now with open source. And um, yeah, happy to have you here and having this conversation. So I, I wanted to spend some time talking about what Repl is doing now. Yep. Uh, so you'd mentioned earlier Cloud9. Cloud9 was actually my, I also got an introduction to proper getting environment set up. Like Ruby on Rails, their guide was Cloud, like they oh, pointed awesome. you to Cloud9 early, early, yeah. early days. And, um, but what Repl is today, like what, how would you describe it? Um, Replit is a, a cloud programming environment. It is a community of programmers. It's a social network for programmers. Um, it is a hosting and deployment service. Um, and more recently, it's also, I think, the first fully AI-powered IDE. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, uh, is that Ghost Rider is your... Yes. That, that feature? Yes. Excellent, yeah. Yeah, um, so happy to dig into uh, any, any one of the... Yeah, yeah, so so Repolit, from my understanding, I always do like a couple of different scripts, like bots, mm -hmm. like Discord bots. Uh, I know you had a, a, a bit of marketing around that, but I was doing that before the right. marketing. Uh, running stuff in the background, just needed to write some rough JavaScript that I just needed to have up and running. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was like my use case a couple mm -hmm. years ago. Uh, I know you all have expanded to like, now you have teams that mm -hmm. can be on the platform. So is the goal to... I have a company. Do I go to Repolit and invite my team to collaborate? Yeah. So, so ultimately, the goal is to be able to run all software, all sorts of software in Repolit. Yeah. But we want to do it in a tasteful way. We don't want to do it for the sake of doing it. We want to do it because it's a better experience, right? And so we're trying to invent or build the abstractions or primitives so that you know slowly we're layering in more and more power. So like the core part was like okay you get a you get a container in like less than a second ready for you to kind of type code and run it right and then we layered in uh, autocomplete using LSP then we layered in packager and our packager is an open source uh, thing called the universal package manager it's main innovation that it detects uh, it guesses the packages you need from the structure of a project uh, yeah. and installs it for you. And so every step of the way, we're like, how can we innovate on that piece so that when people adopt Replit, they want to adopt it because it is fundamentally better than any other alternative. Um, and so, okay, we had the packager, uh, oh, we had LSP, debugger, and then, um, uh, and then the hosting j just came naturally because people were already hosting scripts on Replit. Yeah. And it just like made sense like, oh, I want to develop a web app. So, okay, like you're going to be able to run that here and then we show you the web view. And then it's, oh, I want to be able to keep it always on, keep it running. So now you can pay a little bit of money and just keep that running. The collaboration side, we were also one of the first to kind of make it uh, like a default multiplayer experience, sort of like Figma, yeah. but for code. And um, uh, and that that exploded, especially in, um, in uh, education at first. Yeah. Um, and a lot of educators found it to be very useful during the pandemic. It just, it just, it just really became our sort of flagship feature. Then companies started coming and knocking on our doors like, Hey, I want to use this for interviewing. I want to use this for prototyping, internal collaboration. Um, and so we built Teams Pro. So we have the education offering, and now we have a Teams offering. I will say that Replit is not ready yet to run your entire company on yeah. it. Um, we still have a few things to figure out, namely around scalability. Right now, all projects are capped at one gigabyte, and so that really doesn't... 
Uh, you can run any like your main code base on that. But I would say if you adopt it at your company uh, for, you know, for bots, for um, uh, trying out libraries, for testing things, for prototyping things, for internal apps, uh, and, and even for small microservices and things like that, it will really make a dent on your velocity. And yeah. it, it just like makes like programming at the company more fun. It also makes it more accessible. So we found companies that adopt Replit, they start having their marketing teams code a little bit or change a little yeah. bit of code here and there. You have product managers kind of spinning up experiments using code. And so it really makes code a core part of the yeah. uh, of the culture. Yeah, and I love that too as well because like that's doing DevRel, like I fit in that sort of marketing bucket where mm -hmm. We have a quick side project. So like things that I did at GitHub was like skyline.github.com. I did work on that one directly, but actually the one I did work really on cool. yeah. was stars.github.com, mm -hmm. which is just the aggregate for all of our MVP, stars, high impact individuals that we want to connect with, share their content. Um, it's essentially a CMS with a, a bunch of photos. And that's something that I, I like to throw those things together really quickly, but I have a lot of hoops to jump through. Mm -hmm. uh, so at GitHub, we had the, we, one of my projects were the ones that discovered the Heroku <laughs> incident. Oh, really? Um, wow. So, like, we definitely got to knock on the door and be like, hey, mm. there's a vulnerability. Uh, you got to move off Heroku. So, mm. I lost that. So, mm. I had to use the, the GitHub cloud infrastructure to get a simple project up and running. Like actions? Uh, not even actions. They have an internal, like, Kubernetes thing mm. called Moda. Uh, so, that's what deploys things like GitHub mm -hmm. that after moving off Heroku. <laughs> this is, like, public knowledge, but also mm. inside baseball. Mm. Uh, but then actions is what powers GitHub pages now. Mm -hmm. uh, and oh, that also... Awesome. Uh, is un underlying technology is now Azure. So there's a lot of hoops to jump through as a non-engineer at a company that has a lot yeah. of engineers. You have to get like sign off to be like, oh yeah, yeah, you're good. You can start shipping stuff to production. Even if it's like your own dumbed down production server, yeah. there's a lot of hoops to jump through. So like I did a lot of GitHub apps works yeah. that were powered by Repolit. Yeah, uh, awesome. Wow. Yeah, because <laughs> I didn't want to host anything that had to get like the sign off or a bunch of eyes on there because yeah. I knew this, this would be a workshop. This would be like a, a short live, like maybe yeah. a summer project. I didn't need like <laughs> to go down those hoops if it was yeah. never going to live. Look, I mean, software engineering has progressed in an amazing way. Like um, when I when I first got my job, everyone was yoloing things into production. <laughs> oh right? yeah, that was like <laughs> that was the thing. But what we've lost is the sort of fun. Uh, like let's hack something together and and get it out really quickly. Yeah. And so Replit is kind of bringing that. And even on the version control scenario, like Git is an amazing piece of technology, but also Git is hard for most people, right? Yeah. And so we actually just released um, this like uh, sort of YouTube like or video like scrubber for history. And so okay. you can like go back and forth in your, Wait, in your when code. did you uh, release that? Two or three weeks ago or something. Oh, like nice. that. I gotta look yeah. that up. Yeah. That's uh, something we were messing around because we've got insights into uh, historical commits. Yeah. Because uh, what we're building is Git base. That's a very, very interesting thing. So ours is that. based on operational transforms. Okay. So every piece of edit we're recording and you can go back and forth and say you're interested in one version, there's a toggle that says compare and then it shows you a diff yeah. between your current version and that version. Okay, and it's not using Git under the hood? It's not using Git, it's using operation transforms. I think it would make sense to start using Git in, like you can have a checkpoint, you yeah. can say like, oh, I'm like, you know, this state of the code is actually something I wanna store in Git. So I think it's like a sort of a layer above Git yeah. that is like more, it's easier, it's you, It's more minute, it shows all the different details. It also has the multiplier information. Yeah. You can sort of tell who changed what code. Uh, but at some point, like you're like, okay, this is a working piece of code, which is how I think about Git. Git commit is sort of, okay, I made a checkpoint and I care about this. Yeah. And it is like, it is like a more powerful tool, but it's not the thing that you wanna be using all the time. Yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating too as well. And like I think I think we've uh Git is now ingrained in a lot of at least web and mobile development yep. that I don't think we have to know the basics anymore when you get started step zero, learn how to code. It just and that's the I guess this is like going full circle of like mm -hmm. where you're coming from, where you just want to get started. And yeah. if you have to get started, you have to learn this my ex example is when I learned iOS programming, 
I picked up the the Big Nerd Ranch book. Uh, it was the Objective Objective C book because that's what everyone said you had to write Objective C. You open up the book and it says in the preface, it's like, oh, before you go through this book, go buy the C book. <laughs> Oh my God. And I was like, oh, okay. So I got the C book and I'm like, okay, cool. And it's like C, but by the way, assembly. And I was like, oh, okay. I guess, do I need to know assembly? I'm going to just write C. I don't know. But also C is not getting me to writing iOS apps. Yeah. That's, so like that's I was nice. like kicked back a step, not needing, like it wasn't that they told you go buy the book, but it was like, hey, you can learn more getting the book. So I'm like, I want to know what I need to know. Turns out I could just read the Objective C book. Hey, the the I see this all the time where uh, Haya, my my co-founder slash wife, when she wanted to learn how to code, she took a course at General Assembly, and the first day, um, uh, they taught her how to use Git, and she got super confused. It's like, is this programming? <laughs> like, what am I doing? Like, it's like the idea of you know uh, actually Seymour Papert talked about Seymour Papert is. MIT, the founder of MIT Media Lab, they built like Turtle logo programming. Yeah. They now have Scratch. It's an amazing yeah. lab. And they think a lot about learning and tools. And he called this the project tool inversion. So most, uh, most people, when they want to teach something, they teach the tool first before the use case. Yeah. And that actually most people's brains don't work that way. Yeah. For the most part, you want to be able to run into the problem so run yeah. into the problem that version control solves first. Introducing version control before the problem is just going to lead to massive amounts of confusion. Yeah, yeah, and, and fatigue. And like you mm. mentioned, uh, you'd work cross paths with Babel and, and Sebastian. Mm. And I know he had popularized a bunch of tooling fatigue uh, mm -hmm. back in the day. And I think it was a common thing about like if you want to know how to do React, you've got to get deep into the Webpack config. Yeah. And um like there just it isn't enough time in the day. Like, no. You know, this. <laughs> no, and the way I learned how to code is I had an app idea. I yeah. was getting my MBA, and I was like, oh, I could be an entrepreneur. Let me learn how to code so I could build all my ideas. And uh, I had the idea, like, built it, and then I walked away with, like, a job eventually because I could build something from zero to production sort of on Heroku. I mean, that's the that's the dream, right? Like, you should be able to to do that and like what that signals is that I'm going to figure out whatever in my way. Yeah. Right. Like, but I don't have to go down to the atoms and quarks to understand like yeah. the entirety of the, everything. Yeah. Yeah. Very know? true. Yeah. 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 Which is amazing. Like, so by the way, one, one criticism yeah. of Replit is that, is that we, we introduced magic and like people don't know what's happening under the hood. It's actually not really true. When people come to Replit and they learn the basics, they actually get intrigued how things work. A lot of the, young people, teenagers who grew up with Replit actually understand the system from the ground up. They reverse engineer Replit, they build things like Replit, they kind of build tools for Replit. And so actually people end up learning a lot more. So the idea is that you need to sort of start from scratch and it's actually the other way around. You wanna show the value proposition and then people have the motivation to learn the kind of the under the hood stuff. Yeah. Yeah, which is true. And this is a, when I got to GitHub, there's a whole team put together about onboarding mm. because GitHub being a power tool, when you sign up back in 2018, when you sign up to GitHub, you then it's you're coerced into creating a repo, but then you get yeah. that screen of like, here's some Git commands to run. Yeah. And it was like, what is that? <laughs> yeah. And at that point, like at that, I was like 25 million users at that point. Everyone at that point was like, I already knew Git by the time I got to GitHub or I learned everything else I needed to know. Someone told me to sign up for GitHub. I know what to do here. But, and, but they saturated that market. Yeah, so the market like, was saturated. Yeah, so yeah. You, you have to go into the Gen Z or the up and coming developers, right. the high schoolers to teach them, hey, if you want to do a quick Twitch bot, right. like go ahead and copy and paste this thing, drop it in the REPL, hit run, and now you've, you've got commands going. Right. And uh, it's like ingenious to start that way as opposed to go learn the basics to Git and like what the what this markdown text that I have to do stuff with. Yep, exactly. Absolutely. Excellent. Yeah. So uh, we're almost at time. So I want to wind this down, but I appreciate uh, you coming over and having this conversation. Uh, it, it was fascinating to hear your open source journey um, as part of this journey of Repolit. Because yeah. just by throwing stuff out there and just like sort of, you were sort of watering the garden this entire time to eventually he had his massive tree, which was Repolit. And that's. And I would say open source <laughs> still still part of the journey of Repolit. Yeah. Like, like 95% of the code on Replit is open source. People just open source it by default. I think open source has become ingrained in everything yeah. that we do. 
uh, we didn't get to talk about the AI too much, but if you look at what's happening in the AI yeah. space, it's actually fascinating how open source disrupted the entire space. There's a open source project that dropped uh, a month ago called Stable Diffusion. Yeah. Um, that uh, typically this is a, a product of big AI labs like OpenAI or Google or DeepMind. Um, but for the first time, you had a super powerful uh, AI model in the open, and uh, the amount of creativity and tooling that was built in one month is absolutely fascinating yeah. and, and and explosive. So, uh, I think open source will continue to change the world, and um, and and hopefully, at Replit, will play a part of it in in terms of onboarding more and more people to to open source. Yeah, for sure. So definitely be keeping an eye on that. And uh, folks, make sure you like and subscribe. And uh, yeah, let us know who else you want on the, the show.